What up, everybody? Welcome back. It's Rip City Real Talk after a big week in Blazerland. It's Craig Moscow, Anthony Blaylock. We're back for another episode, and we're ready to break down kind of a rough, crazy, up-and-down, tumultuous week. What's up, buddy? Man, uh, you're not kidding. Uh, this is, as far as the record goes and some recent injuries and things like that, you know, it's enough to really break your Portland spirit over here. But, because everybody knows... It finally happened. And no, I don't mean the CJ trade that should have happened, but the reason why it hasn't happened, Neil Olshay gone, got the boot, got the can. He is out. I mean, I think you and me are pretty ecstatic. We're going to break all that down. Um, we're obviously going to go through our recaps like we normally do before we get into the celebration that is no more Neil, some hashtag no more Neil. I don't know if that's a thing or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, we bad stretch uh, we didn't go through 500 or better we went one and three on the week not yeah. ideal especially since three of these games were at home which has kind of been our thing so yeah lots to break down we got quite a bit of news little things to hit on this week of course a new blaze and new trails i think most people will probably be able to figure out the big news new situation with the next blazer here pretty quick like but uh how are you Good, man. Everything's rocking and rolling here. We're going to do some new stuff this episode. We're actually going to yeah. show a little film breakdown and talk through some of the things that we think are happening on the defensive end. And then uh, stay tuned until the end because there is going to be a huge, you know, with Neil being gone, we're going to cover that near the end of the pod. So we're going to do our normal week recap, but uh, everything's great, man. Yeah. And speaking of that, uh, for you who are the audio listeners on all the different podcast websites, we know we do this on YouTube and we do this on the pods we release the audio version separately so this might be a little weird for you we, we mm -hmm. promise it's still pretty cool stay tuned we're still going to talk about what we see however we will be showing the film the highlights that we're going to be breaking down and they'll be quick little hits nothing crazy mm -hmm. um, but this will be on the youtube page if you want to check us out on here feel free to search trip city real talk you know hit the subscribe button while you're at it if not then you can at least watch the beginning of it later or just listen along and we'll do our best to to explain what we're seeing when we see it and try to make it a visual for you even though it's the audio version yeah you ready to jump in I'm ready to jump in buddy starting with oh, the jazz pitter patter so starting with the jazz here we go starting with the jazz you know anytime you play in utah against this team right now they're always gonna smother i mean they're they're just a really tough defensive team what i didn't expect from them was just really strong ball movement they really crushed us on the offensive end with ball movement Joe Ingles is always a problem, but I mean, what else did you have from this game? Uh, I thought Nurk looked all right, especially playing against you know Gobert most of the time. He ended up with twenty four and ten, which is solid. Mm -hmm. uh, Simons continued his strong play off the bench. You know, he, we went through some lulls there for a little bit with him. He wasn't looking super hot. We've kind of talked about it. And the last couple of games, he's really stepped back up. He ended up with twenty four. Um, I mm -hmm. believe, if I'm not mistaken, he was our highest score in this game. Um, right there with Nurk, I suppose, yep. but uh, which is great to see. But you know, like you said, we we've been terrible on the road as is. Uh, the Jazz are already a tough team. Damian Lillard does not at his best health right now. He's obviously after he played the Jazz game, and then he's going to miss ten straight after that. At least they're going to reevaluate him, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that affects us, obviously. But when you're kind of already down down on people, that's that's tough. It's tough to go into Utah. They're one of the best teams in the West right now. All their starters did what their starters should be doing, except Conley. He kind of had an off game. I think he only had two points, which is not yeah. normal for Conley. But, you know, their bench. They they obviously had guys like Rudy Gay got 14. Clarkson, who's the sixth man of the year and is a candidate every year to repeat that award, had 22 just tough. <laughs> Just yeah. tough to, to stay with those guys. Mitchell is amazing. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, him and Devin Booker, to me, are two of the best up-and-coming scoring shooting guards in the league. They do a little bit of everything, but they give us fits all the time because mm. CJ can't defend and Dame struggles to defend. So, I don't know. Just just tough to go into Utah and expect to get a win. This one wasn't really close. Uh, it started off kind of close. We were able to hang in there for a minute. Mm -hmm. And then Utah just being the more – experienced team and the healthier team quite frankly mm -hmm. uh, did what they did what they were supposed to do 
And they have two small guards as well. I mean, it's not like Mitchell and Conley are a lot bigger than Dame and CJ, but they're both a lot scrappier defensively. And when you talk about Gobert, there's a reason he's a defensive player of the year candidate, and he's really good at that drop coverage. I mean, I know he can't run out to the perimeter as much as people want him to, but he's an amazing shot blocker. And that's why a lot of the time he deters people from going down into the paint against them. And when they know you're going to stay out on the perimeter and they can defend you with you know, Bogdanovich and Ingles and all those guys, and they throw them at you. And Ingles kind of carves us up on the offensive end because he's this big kind of wing facilitator. He destroyed us on the on the defensive end for Portland. It was kind of rough. So um, he picked us apart really quick. Yeah, and Conley, you know, Conley comes from Memphis, the grindhouse. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're just been built historically on really good defensive teams, they're like the Pittsburgh Steelers of the NBA. Yeah. They're always just a good defensive team. I mean, a little – worse of late but he was part of a lot of those teams with Gasol and and whatnot and so you know he may not score a lot but for being a smaller size guard he still makes us struggle to score when you have a guy like Gobert down low and you have a guard out there like what Conley can do to slow things down and and the wing defenders that they have that's tough sledding it is yeah so I just want to show you something today that i pulled up today from this game so I mean we'll talk about showing some highlights real quick I want to show you something so Real quick, I'm going to show you what the Blazers look like on the defensive end here against this team. Right here, you're going to see Joe Ingles up at the top left. Now, look, this is good ball movement. Okay, I'm about to start this clip up, and it's really good ball movement. He's going to kick down to Mitchell. But what I want you to keep an eye on during this clip is I want you to watch CJ really closely because over the next two possessions, watch CJ's defense and what he decides to do in his decision-making. Ingles is going to kick to Mitchell. CJ is going to completely miss him on a closeout. And for some reason, I don't know why that happened, but we'll just roll it. (sighs) Into the next play, Mitchell kicks. He moves. CJ sucks into the middle and tries to help pinch. I don't understand why he would do that. Now Donovan Mitchell is once again wide open. CJ is going to rotate over and get him to the shot so back to back possessions. What'd you see? Right, right off the bat here. Uh, first off, you should mute these videos while you're playing them because the sound is a little annoying. Also, uh, what I'm seeing right here is so CJ's got to be aware of Mitchell. He's their top scoring player on the team. You have to recognize that you have Nurk down low. It, it seems like a lack of communication, a lack of trust. Nurk is there in case he gets around his primary defender. And it did look like he was able to get past Little. Mm-hmm. But where is he going to go? I mean, he's going to run right into Nurk if he tries to drive. The only viable play that he had was a kick out to Mitchell, who was going to the corner. And TJ gets caught staring inside, puts his hand up, and he's not able to recover. He's not quick enough. His footwork isn't good. And he's not tall enough to disrupt his shot. That is too easy, and it happens way too often. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's the number one thing I saw. And the same thing happened on the play before. CJ gets caught looking in. His mm-hmm. guy's out there one on one. There's, I mean, that's his person to defend. And a, once again, he's staring inside, worrying about the help and not paying attention to his person that's two open threes. It was simple. I mean, and when you look at a game like this, Mitchell drops 30 on you. And a lot of it was based on ball movement within the offense. But CJ just could not body or keep on Donovan Mitchell. He kept losing him. His focus is not very good. And I don't know why you would suck in on angles right there when there's a superior defender attached to his hip. You're not going to really do anything in that case. You need to stay on your man. It's Little just, is a good recovery defender. He's long and he's quick. He can you. catch up and get, get blocks from behind, slow things down. And not just that, but you also have Nurk right there. He's sitting down there. It's not like Ingles is getting past the both mm-hmm. of them. The only, like I said, the only thing that they could have did was kick out to the corner right there, which is exactly what they did. And CJ has to recognize that he got burnt by it two times in a row. And that's to me, like defensively, I understand where, you know, the system at times that Chauncey has instilled, it doesn't work or it does work. It doesn't really matter to me. At this point, it's roster, it's construction, it's CJ and Dame being on the court at the same time. As long as you run into teams that can shoot from the perimeter, which is basically every team except for like the bottom. Nowadays. Like the, the bottom, like five to eight teams in the league can't really shoot, right? As well as the other teams can. Well, we make them look like they can shoot. <laughs> but that's why, right? And then the other point is CJ cannot recover in the way maybe he thinks he can, right? Like he thinks he can lag off a little bit and then come back and get a hand up. He wasn't even close on those two no. shots by Mitchell. And Mitchell knew those were coming, dude. It's like 
th- that kills the Blazers all the time. So that's that, I just want to show a quick clip. That was yeah, pretty much what I had. It's there. it's purposely attacking our guards. We've seen it before. Mm-hmm. We saw them in the Clippers whiteboard. I mean, we've talked about that. They knew exactly what they were going to do. They rolled Mitchell out because they knew that CJ wasn't going to be able to get over there. That he has a tendency to do that, and it's it's just money. It, it happens all the time. Yeah, and it is what it is. So I just wanted to show those couple clips. We'll have a couple yep. more from some of the games coming up. I'll make sure they're muted so that we can't hear them. Yeah, that was my first too. go with that. But, wow. you know, it's it's one of those things where, look, we've talked about it for a couple of years now. I, I, I think this team is good enough offensively to do some things when Dame is healthy. But defensively, they're just not going to get there. And the new system is not going to make CJ less of a weak link in the chain. It's not going to make Dame feel more comfortable at that point of attack. And those two guys are... Are just going to continue to get hunted on defense. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on a little okay. bit. Now we have Detroit. This is the only win of the week. We won one ten to ninety two. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at this game. I've gotten to go to quite a few games this year for being a non season ticket holder. It was pretty impressive. Uh, I want to thank Jeff and Mike for the tickets. Edge Link supported me and my girl on a night out. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're a tech recruiting company. Highly recommend if you're in the tech industry that you check them out. If you're looking to fill positions and or looking for a new role for yourself. Uh, but yeah, we got to go to this game. It was, it was exciting. It was fun. Cool. Um, for me personally, I was stoked to get to see the first little bit of Cade Cunningham, number one overall pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was exciting. And this was arguably one of his best games of the season. Of course, the Blazers make everybody look good. Yeah, but he had 26 points. He had seven rebounds. He had five threes. He looked great. He looked um, fantastic defensively, too. I mean, he yeah. looked like kind of a menace on the defensive end. He looked like exactly what he was supposed to be. He's a bigger yep. guard. Um, yep. And he had a really nasty mid-range game going. I mean, everything was clicking for him. And it was, it was a great. And then Jeremy Grant, who's probably my number one trade target out there as far as mm. forwards go. I think Detroit's going to be in a rebuilding phase for a couple of years now. I think Grant, they could afford to get rid of and it can't hurt to have a guard like CJ to go along with Kate Cunningham. And then you can go draft a center or another bigger forward to, to build around. Uh, so yeah, take a first round pick or two have to give me Jeremy mm-hmm. Grant and CJ. Um, you can have CJ. It's a good deal. Sure. Um, but that was a fun one. CJ looked good. Actually. This was the first game that Dame didn't play. Um, so that was kind of a big deal for us. And then little didn't play in this one either. So Good to see them get a road win despite being down quite a few guys. Um, but the big thing, I think both you and me thought this was the biggest takeaway from this game, was the hotness. Mm-hmm. I was sizzling. I was close to the court, and I was sweating mm-hmm. with how hot Ben McLemore's shooting was. Yep, The guy had to play some minutes because of some injuries. He came in, and all he did was get 17 points and hit four three-pointers and look amazing. A little scrappy on the defensive end didn't overly impress me, but he, yeah. he hustled, and you know he's playing against backup guards, so fine. Uh, but yeah, he's red hot all week. We'll talk a little more about that. But great to see him get some run. You know, these guys sit on the bench; they wait for their opportunity. He's a vet; he's been in the league; he's been around. You know, I, I highly doubt he's super thrilled with the role he's had with Portland. I'm sure it was explained to him, and he was a minimum contract guy. But great to see him come off the pine and go in there and just start, you know, slinging the rock and hitting four threes and looking like he belongs on the team, looking like he earns his roster spot. So that was really cool. What'd you think? Good defense. I mean, that's the first thing that stood out in this game. I think Nurkic made some really good hedges. You saw some really good ball movement out of the Blazers. Larry Nance looked good at times. And then Ben McElmore. I mean, Ben looked awesome. He lit it up sometimes. He's just kind of electric on the offensive end. Defensively, there wasn't a ton to shout out. Like you said, without Dame, you can throw some lineups out there that can be a little more formidable defensively. Um, but I, I think that this was one of the examples of this is a bad team. The Blazers need to put them away quick. And they did. I mean, they, they went out there and took care of business at home. You were, I think, three rows up from the floor. So you can basically <laughs> nice. smell the players. Dude, that was crazy. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a great game and a great game for you to be at. Yeah, it was good to be home. You know, it was a rough road trip, obviously. So you come home to Motor where we were 10 and 1 coming in. Uh, so we expect to be the team like Detroit. And I said it, you know, I was talking to people next to me and I said, third quarter, put them away. Just put yes. them away. You're already up 10 coming into the quarter. This is a bad team. All you need to do is hit 20 by the time that that third quarter ends. Mm-hmm. And they aren't, they aren't coming back. And they didn't. We got to see some garbage time pretty early. Guys got to get some minutes in there. Really hoping for the, the Greg Brown dunk, but. <sighs> Ah, I would love to see you live, but yeah, oh. uh, they're just the team you need to be. Yep. Uh, so do you have any clips you want to share from this one before we move to the next game? I do. Yeah. Let me set it up real quick. So I, 
man, this was kind of an interesting game. And like I said, I was talking about um, that hedge from NERC. So let's let me show you an example of what I'm talking about when I say a hedge. So in this clip right here, and I'm, I just want to freeze frame this. So there's three players up at the point of attack, right? So this is going to be Anthony Simons. You're going to look at NERC, and here's going to be CJ. When I roll this clip forward, I want you to watch Nurkic's body as he sort of leans, and he's going to hedge. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So Nurk comes right here. He's going to cut the ball defender off, or as a defender, he's going to cut the ball off right here. Now, when Nurkic cuts this off, this is completely different. This is the Chauncey system, and this actually is working perfectly right here. Once I press forward, though, watch CJ on this defense right here. This gets completely blown by. So Because he wasn't out there again. He was caught looking inside. They were able to make that pass to his guy. He now has to react and run out, and he doesn't have the footwork to cut back when his guy turns and goes around him. And that's why for years you and I talked about it's not coaching, right? Like as much as we want to sit here and say it's coaching, yes, the new system is helpful defensively, but you still don't have the correct roster and the correct players to stop a good offensive team. Now, Detroit is not a very good offensive team. Cade Cunningham, Killian Hayes, they're figuring things out. Isaiah Stewart had a double-double, but it's not a good offensive team. It's not a team that's going to carve you up. So let me show you one more quick play, and let me show you just kind of what I mean here. I'm going to go back a little bit in this game <clears throat> right here. <clears throat> okay, this is an offensive play, but I'm going to show you a defensive play on the next set. All right, so you're going to watch Nurk right here. Again, he's going to hedge, so watch. As soon as he comes around the corner, he's going to cut the ball off. Boom. Then he gets back on his man, and then he also almost cuts that guy off. Now, I would rather live with a guy driving and making a really good take on a layup than a wide-open three. So I do like this defense, but I just don't think we have the correct roster to play it. No, I mean, even though they're except their guards are getting around and they're still able to get to the rim. And the problem with that, which is fine, like you said, it's mm -hmm. not a bad thing. You live with that over a three. Yeah. But when you don't have your center down there, he's now having to run after somebody. And there's been times where he's able to recover, and that's great. But there's a lot of guards that are going to just absolutely fillet you when you try to do that. He was able to get by. There's nobody at the rim. And if we happen to notice it in time, and if somebody's able to rotate down and help, they usually end up leaving their guy wide open and there's a kick out yep. to a corner three. That is a problem. It's improving. Mm -hmm. It is improving. But I'm sorry. Nurk is not the most athletic big guy out there. He is a big guy. He's mm -hmm. great at what he does. And he has the athleticism to be able to recover. I mean, he was almost there. You're right. Yep. But more often than not, he's going to get burnt. And that's where the recognition has to be there from other guys to be able to help and then realize when an open shooter is left outside and continue to go help and push back out on that as well. Yeah. That's what's been killing Portland. It that has. We need to improve on. And I just, I just think it's worth like actually watching in these breakdowns because I think people think, okay, new defensive system, it's going to work. Well, it's not working, and there's a multitude of reasons why. Sometimes it's Nurk's effort. Sometimes it's not. Like in this Detroit game, Nurkic was really good. There was just a lack of help defense at times. In the Utah, and then we'll talk about the Spurs here in a minute, it was mostly just really good ball movement carving the Blazers apart. Like you were talking about just there, they kicked to the corner. There was all – I mean, I think the Blazers are – Number one in the league at giving up corner threes. If they're not number one, they're in the top three. I know that right now. Or one of the worst defensive teams in three-point percentage as it is. Horrible. So, and, and that's and a reason for it. I think you can see that in these two clips or these three clips we've watched so far is like A, CJ's defense, and B, just a little bit of over-rotating and not dropping enough. Yep. But it, either way, Detroit, yep. a win. A win we should get. And the next team, another team that we should have beat, 6-13, and 13, the Spurs coming in. It's it's another home game. The Spurs <clears> are <throat> one of those weird teams that always gives us trouble. I don't yes. I don't care how bad they are. Every single year they tend to be scrappy. They've had some of these same super athletic players and Keldon Johnson and Derek White and Jonte Murray. I mean, they're ridiculous. They got Yaka Podal, Pedal, yeah. Poetal. I mean, they're they're just a tough team. They always play as hard. And I don't care what anybody says, Becky Hammond is pissed. She was mad about the interview process. She had to go and show us up. She's like, watch this. This is what you passed on. Let me come in here and beat you real fast of my 6 13 team. Yeah. Uh, so, so that happened. I believe this is the game. No, this was so this was the game. Yeah. So Simon or Simons was still playing in this one. He just didn't play very long because he got yeah, hurt. He got hurt. So this is the game that he got hurt. Mm-hmm. 
But again, I mean, nobody on their team really did anything to blow your mind. They just got out and hit a ridiculous clip from three early. They could not miss. They were absolutely on fire. And we just didn't have anybody without Dame to, to really get us back and continue to keep us in the game long enough to be able to make any runs that were mm-hmm. substantial. I mean, even CJ, yeah. What do you end up with? 16 points 16. in 32 minutes? I'm sorry. You pay the guy a lot of money. A lot of money to be the guy, the borderline all-star. 16 points against the Spurs, and they're a team that's going to give all of our guards problems. They give a lot of guards problems because of their length and the way that they cut. But I'm sorry. Those are the games where you need to step up. It got out of hand early. They were able to fight back. They made it closer than it probably really seemed because they pulled away in the end there. They were able to kind of keep fighting, keep fighting, get down to 15, get down to 12. Mm Mm-hmm. But you got down so much so early that you just don't have the firepower without Dame out there. And when Simon's got hurt, your bench struggles even more. It just isn't going to work out. And, I mean, like you said, CJ needs to step up in these games and score you 25. He's going to get plenty of shots. He's going to be able to do what he wants against the defense. And he's he ISO'd a lot in these games. He just didn't look very good offensively. It was really frustrating, actually. And like you said, DeJounte Murray had a double-double with 13 assists. He was really good. I mean, yeah. DeJounte Murray the ball is like, movement. oh, my God, dude. I, I'll show you in the clip here in a minute. But the, the ball movement that the Spurs used, I, I do think Becky Hammond, and I do think coaching has a lot to do with <laughs> yeah. that ball movement. I think that they put guys in positions to make those passes. But, dude... That this was one of those games that's like you want to rip your hair out. I mean, the Blazers should win this game. There's they're no one of the youngest for. rosters in the league. I mean, there's no excuse for it. Even if with Anthony Simons rolling his ankle after 11 minutes the way he did, dude. Yeah, come on, this is ridiculous. There's no excuse for this. The guy's got to come out and be energized. They didn't. They looked flat from the jump. They came out, fell behind. They weren't closing out. They weren't rotating the ball very much on offense. It was not a beautiful game of basketball. And the Spurs were terrible in the second half. They couldn't hit it. I don't know, I know what happened at halftime, but maybe they looked in the mirror and they saw their uniform. Actually, I like their uniform. What do you think about their uniforms? That really dug the uniforms. <laughs> the Miami Dolphins Spurs? No, they were they were like the orange and there was the sunrise yeah. colors and the weird teal. It's a culture thing down there, I'm pretty sure. Um, it was legit. They're like Miami, I, they're Miami Dolphins colors, man. Orange it was not teal. the Miami Dolphins colors. You're offending somebody right now. You knock off. <laughs> but... <laughs> I don't, care I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe they were just like, wow, we look great. And they came out and were like, look at these unis. We're going to show up. Becky Hammond's revenge game. And then maybe that wore off at halftime because they couldn't they couldn't hit anything. It was pretty bad. Yeah, uh, but we couldn't make up for it. We, we no. were just as bad. We didn't do anything to get ourselves back in the game when they were shooting the, just terrible. I mean, their defense was good. They're long. But we really had opportunities to get back in the game and couldn't hit yes. a freaking shot. Yep, it was bad. I mean, offensively, that was where it was. I mean, I understand. I understand that on the defensive end, the Blazers are always going to give up points, right? But offensively, you expect they scored eighty-three points in this game. That's not going to yeah. get it done. You think we missed Dame or what? Um, yeah, that's all I have as far as some quick notes of it. I know you got a couple of clips you want to show. Let me keep yep. rolling until we get to I Boston. Do. I do. Let me take a look here. So, all right. In the clip, oh, that's I'm right. Show. They had they had big buckets. Yeah, McBuckets. Yeah, I McBuckets. There. I forgot right. he was there. The energy. He Here we go. Couple games coming into this one. All right. So I want you to watch this ball movement here. Just watch it. Boom, boom. Breaks it down. Boom. And Roko just stand in there. I know it's not good. Here's another one. Watch this. Boom, boom. Murray's gonna move and... it through. Boom. I mean, it's a decent closeout if you're Rocco, but I, I look. Too many guys in the middle down there just staring. Exactly. It's a lot of watching the ball rotate around and not staying attached to your man. I think that that's something that Chauncey needs to isolate more in his film sessions. I'm not a genius at basketball, but when your guy is able to kick and penetrate and move the ball like that, and there's no one attached to his hip and there's really no resistance, they're going to get way too comfortable doing that. And that's exactly what happened in the Warriors, the Utah, the Spurt, all these, all these games over the last week. That's what happened. And it looked great to start. You know, they were able to force – McDermott to the sideline. It looked like he wasn't going to be able to get away from there. And then he hits that one pass. And it's almost like they caught us off guard. Like they almost expected him to either step out of bounds right. or to have him trapped. And when he kicked it, there was just no, that, that second rotation after the ball initially gets passed. We just got lost and it happens way too much. 
It does. Again, I, I think that a lot of this was an ugly week for Chauncey as far as coaching goes. I don't think a lot of this is 100% his fault. I do think a lot of it is roster, but there are some things here that's like a really good defensive team like the Warriors in Utah. This stuff doesn't really happen to them. You can't really carve them up and make them just look awful for three quarters of the game if you want to. They can adjust and punch you back in the mouth, and the Blazers just don't have that right now. Agreed. Um, but I will Boston. say this: they did kind of look like the Miami Dolphins uniforms. You were right. I told, I, when right? I saw them again, all right, I looked at them again, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll give you the the teal and the orange in it. Yep. Okay, all right, all right, fair enough. We'll buy our good buddy Nick a Spurs jersey, <laughs> dude. We should. <laughs> we should. All right, uh, go ahead and take this, take this uh, Celtics game. This probably one of the, the, if not the worst loss of the season, definitely up there is one of the worst losses differential wise as far as points go. 145 Horrible. to 117. You know, no little, no Dame. We already knew that. We lost Simons in that last Spurs game. So we were already coming in limping. I, I don't know what you say about it. I mean, Jason Tatum's an all star, borderline superstar in this league. We made Dennis Schroeder look like he was super smart for turning down the Lakers' ridiculously big contract. Like, huh. What like I don't I, I just mean like, like you couldn't stop anybody like there's no Peyton Pritchard shouldn't be getting 19 points on you. No. Um, no. I'm okay Norman with Tatum. Powell hasn't looked great the last couple games. I know he's still been a little banged up in his defense, but he's sure. got to step up and do a little bit more too. But once again, I mean CJ, yeah, he had 24 points in 35 minutes, and that's that's all peachy. But it was kind of a blowout loss, and there wasn't much that he did. As far as making me impressed, I, I didn't show anything in this game specifically that really blew my mind. There was no specific stats or anything. It's just a better team, and we're just down. Uh, I don't think we had any fire this entire time. It was one of the worst defensive games I've seen us play all year. Uh, you know, a, a head coach that personally was my number one candidate, as a, he's a first time head coach with Emmy over there in Boston. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel bad giving away the free tickets of this. <laughs> I'm be honest with you, I, thought, I was thinking of the Brody the entire time. I'm like, oh man, this part <sighs> free tickets, and this is the game he gets to go see. Is probably the worst game of the year. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have much to say on this one. I, I'm sure you guys. I like what Dennis Smith provided. You know, 21, yes. four and six, well rounded, shot 50 percent from the field. He's had to step up and play more minutes lately, and I've really liked what I see from him. I, I really kind of wish that he would honestly play our start, or starting point guard, but the backup point guard position I'm and like have Anthony play more off ball. I think the yeah. two of them together would be great because I think Smith's got an annoying type of defense about him. He's just quick, not huge, but physical and quick. And then with Simon's length, I think you have a pretty decent defensive rotation, especially when you have Little and Nance out there. Yeah, I'd like to see him get some more minutes, but obviously that takes away from Macklemore, who's been shooting really well. But I yeah. like what I've seen from him. Dennis that was Smith the is the spot that I saw in this game. Dennis I mean, Smith is just a better point guard. I mean, you can see how he facilitates an offense, and he drives down, and he penetrates the paint, and then he tries to pass to the roller. I mean, those are things that Anthony Simons does in very inconsistently. He just does not do them all the time. The other thing that Dennis Smith does, like you said, he's kind of annoying on defense. He's a little more uh, like Seth Curry in yeah, the way like, that he's, uh, he's undersized, but he's going to give you fits. Whereas Anthony Simons just get out. He'll get absolutely blown by the way CJ does sometimes. So that's, I agree with you 100%. I think Smith should earn a little more of those minutes just based on how he's played on both ends of the floor. I, yeah. I don't know, man, this was a really weird game. We came out super flat at home it, with no excuse. It wasn't a back to back. It's not something where the Blazers should come mm-hmm. out flat like this. It's just a really weird vibes game. Yeah. I don't know if you have a clip or not. Uh, to me, I don't really I feel do. like breaking anything down in this one, but you can show it. It, it was just a yeah. bad blowout. Type I got, of game. It was never I got good. one and it's early on in the game. Like it's pretty early here. I'll show it. It won't take but a second. Okay, so if you want to watch, so what I'm going to show again is once the hedge here, you're going to watch Cody. Cody's someone who struggled a little bit with the hedging system. He's not someone who's been very aggressive on defense. So, but if you watch him here, oh wait, let me full full screen this bad boy. Yeah. All right. Screen, so if you yeah. watch Cody, he's going to help cut up, cut him off. Mm-hmm. But watch this ball movement. Boom. Yeah. Who took his man? Nobody, and that's Nobody the took problem. Man, cut right to the rim. It took yep. one pass and a nice yep. looking pass inside. We'll go back to the exact go. same thing, just like you said. Boom. So look how open. 
Mr. Freedom is here. This is un like this is the problem with the defense, man. And like I understand that the new system it, it has goods and bads. It has plus and minuses. I told you earlier, I'd rather have a a layup uh, contested layup than a wide open three. But that rotation right there was a problem, and the Celtics got it over and over and over. And then obviously Tatum just took, went to bat on these yeah. guards. I mean, when you're doing this, because of the fact that we don't recover very well and the rotations are kind of crappy, you're essentially playing two on one up there because Zeller and whoever the guard is is, is, is doing great. They're hedging, they're trapping, they're, they're stopping that initial penetration. But now you have two guys essentially guarding one because the other guy's already left. He's cut somewhere and it takes mm -hmm. one pass and now you're down a man somewhere. Somebody ends up being open. What happens if you do push down there is, is now Roko would have had to have helped. He was the only guy that was around that could have cut to the rim to try to stop that. And now his guy's wide open while Zeller's chasing. Yes. I mean, it's a good breakdown because it's something that we've seen over and over and over and over again. And it's it's leading to all these open shots and just the movement and the assist numbers that we give up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is part of the coaching side. And I get us taking guys time to learn it. But at the same time, you know, I, I've said how accountability turns into ability. It's just not there. It's not. And we don't have the help defenders that you'd need to run this system yet. And we also, like you said, we just don't have the correct roster. Now, maybe you want to run this aggressive system against certain teams. And maybe you want to back off and play drop coverage against certain teams. But we have to know how to flex those things. And we have to be malleable on the defensive end. And right now, the Blazers are not. They just run the same thing over and over again. Sometimes they slip into a little zone. That thing gets absolutely fried every time. Like Danny Morang is actually losing his mind about the zone every time. I think they play Danny's going to go crazy. So... Uh... It's I look, I, I just want to show everybody what we're talking about when we're talking you know, talking on these pods about the defensive end. And so you don't think that we're crazy. I mean, it's really quick. It's you can see it in every single game, whether it works or it doesn't. It worked okay against Detroit. It didn't work against the other three teams this week. Yep. Most of it, we you know we don't break down the specifics and the plays and all that yeah. stuff, but we use our eyes. I mean, we have two of them. We watch these games, we see this <laughs> stuff. We thought that we'd share and, and explain and show you guys what we see, and then we try to explain it. I mean, again, you're right. We're not coaches. We're no basketball professionals. But it doesn't take one to see that guys are getting wide open because guys can't rotate and help and they can't recover fast enough. There's your visual side of it. For the audio people, we're going to try to do this more and more. Um, start showing some clutch plays and close games. We didn't have any close games this week. Yeah. <laughs> we want to play around with the, the film a little bit more. Uh, where did you get your film from? We need to make sure we give them a shout out. Yeah, I'm just basically going on uh, NBA YouTube, checking all the highlights of all the games. So that's something that I do after every game is I watch the YouTube highlights. So I am going to link it in the video um, and mm -hmm. you can go watch any game. It's great. The NBA's YouTube channel is pretty much amazing. It's where I get a lot of my film from. Um, but, you know, like, like you said, just checking one or two defensive plays from each game can give you a temperature check of what happened to the Blazers on yep. that night. No, that's 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 a great example of it. So, like I said, as we get to some of the closer games and it comes in the last couple of minutes, we'll show you some things that yep. we really notice and why they won or lost certain games as we go through and get a little better at some of this stuff. We wanted to try it out. We appreciate you hanging in there, audio people. Yeah, um, I know you get to see it, but you know it's quick. And uh, I think you, a lot of audio people might even know the plays that we're talking about or what's <laughs> happening in general. I mean, so. yeah, it's, it's every play. It seems like. <laughs> Yeah, man. So it's kind of a rough week um, on both ends of the floor. I mean, when you don't have Damian Lillard for three of your games, and I think he wasn't very healthy in that Utah game, there's no excuses. But I just think when you're looking at the team without Dame and, and Nasir Little to an extent, I know Nasir is not a huge part of this team, but he is a good defensive player and an up and comer. He's been great. And Norm Powell doesn't look healthy right now either. I think that he'll get healthy this week, but CJ just didn't really pick up the pieces. All right. Well, that's it. That's all I have on the, the recap yeah. for the games. I'm glad we ended with Boston, um, personally, yeah. because I think you know what's coming. That's going to be the spotlight for our Blazing New Trails X Player of the Week. I need to get you to put something up when we do the YouTube. I'm going to make you like a graphic. I want a song. Yeah. I just, we're going to get better at this. I need some more. Let's do it. Zah! When I post this up, because it's everybody's favorite segment. They all want to know what's going on with all the old Blazers. So Cantor obviously played with us 2018-19. Really, we brought him in 19, and then he played with us again last year. Uh, he's He goes back and forth. He's a big ping pong ball with us in Boston. Um, but I can't call him in as Cantor anymore now, can I? Because everybody's <laughs> news, if they haven't heard, is uh, legally became a U.S. citizen, legally changed his name to Ennis Freedom. 
I'm impressed. Um, I didn't I, you know, buy it in, buy it in the American dream. Uh, nothing was more free than his run to the basket in that play. And <laughs> um, so already living up to the name. Everybody knows he went on a, he went on a show. He had an interview, uh, like it or hate it. You know, he, he at least is happy to be an American. Now he, he came from a tough, a tough setup over in Turkey. He, he's very vocal about, the human rights stuff that happens there. And I'm not going to get into it because it's not my place to be a politician. I'm a basketball guy. Um, but, you know, I, I'm excited for him because he's excited. And, you know, he's not the greatest player. Uh, he does his role. He does what he does well. I liked him when he was here in Portland. I didn't like him with Carmelo. But I liked what he was able to do at times. Is pivotal when it came to us getting to the Western Conference Finals. We lost Nurk that year. He stepped in, battled out with the Steven Adams, Jokic, you know, did all did his best. So happy for him. He's a good dude. Uh, every time he's here, he's one of he's probably a fan favorite. If not, he should be because he's such a happy guy. He involves himself in the city so much. So happy for him. Um, good for you becoming legal. Uh, not sure about the name change, but you know whatever. I mean, whatever floats your boat. It's got to me. It's better than Ocho Cinco or Meta World Peace. So yeah. I'm all I'm all for it. Um, so that's the Blazing New Trails player of the week. And we've touched on Cantor a couple of times in the last year or so because he's, he's doing stuff. But that's that's that. Yeah, man. So I think that's all the news that happened this week. I don't think anything mm-hmm. big happened. Couple quick, couple quick things before we get into the big one, which everybody's probably sitting here waiting for. Um, we've already touched on the injuries. No Dame, no Little, no mm-hmm. Amp. Um, they're going to still be out for a while. Dame was mm-hmm. – when he went out, it was about 10 games. He's played three games – into his 10, supposedly, before he even gets reevaluated. Hmm. The ab injury, uh, it's been lingering apparently for the last couple of years through the Olympics. So we're, we're going to rest him up. He actually looked fine to me personally before he, you know, he missed the one game. He was putting up decent points the last few weeks. He really liked, looked like the old dame. He was hitting deep threes. Uh, but nonetheless, He's hurt. We already talked about the impact that Little has made on the team. Amph has really stepped it up. He's had some slumps which we don't want to see, but he's also been pretty pivotal as mm-hmm. far as pouring off the bench, his three-point shooting. He's been great this year. So how do you think the team holds on with this? <sighs> yeah, so I just looked it up. So they said Dame was going to miss 10 days, not 10 games. So it shouldn't mm-hmm. be as bad. So here's the deal. I got that wrong. That makes more That's sense. Okay. No, next Sunday. So by next Sunday-ish, maybe he comes back for that Timberwolves game. So we'll see. Um, it's Honestly, I want Dame to get healthy because his 21 points per game that he's been scoring has not been his usual per, you know, he's usually 26 to 28. Um, I, I really was an advocate of resting him a little bit, but also Sean Aiken said this week, or maybe it was last week, he said that Dame's been dealing with this injury for like three to four years, he said. So maybe there's no amount of rest that's going to heal this. And like you said, he's been dealing with this since the Olympics. So I hope he can get healthy. But I don't know, man. I think honestly, the biggest thing is Anthony Simon's shot creation and CJ shot creation has to step up a little bit. And the opponents this week are going to get no easier, dude. This this week's schedule is really tough. And so yeah. I don't foresee a great week from the Blazers. And I'm hoping that we can start kicking up some trade talks and things like that over the next month because I, it's not going to get any better on the schedule. Nope. And I told you, I mean, me and me had a little, little argument. No, no, right. it was our first initial disagreement. I just worry about Dame sitting out too long. I want him to get, True. don't get me wrong. If it's an injury that he needs to sit out, mm-hmm. I get it. I do. But if he <clears throat> doesn't absolutely need to be sitting, I want him back in here. We just lost to the Spurs. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the thing that worries me. We don't have the firepower or the punch. CJ is supposed to be that guy. He really hasn't been. So hopefully Dane gets better soon. Um, they're going to so. evaluate after the 10 days. So he very well could come back or they might say, Hey, we're going to give him another week or so. We're just going to make sure yeah. everything is good. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So that's the, that's that news. I'm just, you know, I think amp and little to me are the bigger deal because the bench is, you know, nothing against Mac played really great, but they really added the energy and the fire off the bench that I was I was really looking forward to. Um, Macklemore is another guy this week who looked really good. He had seven threes in some of his stints playing um, in the two games against the Spurs and Detroit. Happy for him, like I said, I already mm-hmm. talked about it. I'm stoked to see him come out here. Um, Chauncey talks all the all the time about loud shots. You know, they bring it up in the games if you watch him. The commentary comes up. 
A loud shot, when they say it, is a shot that really gets the fans into it. That one that really changes momentum, that forces the timeout. You know, we talk about all the time about CJ gets a quiet 21, more often than not. Um, he hasn't hit those big clutch buckets as much as we would like, especially in close games. He has them once in a while, and that is what Ben came out and did, especially in Detroit. I mean, when he hit a three, everybody was like, oh, my God. It changed the entire dynamic. It lets you get up by 20. It lets you stay up by 20. It put that team down. So I'm really happy that he's been able to do that. Uh, Chauncey was upset. He was very upset. He, he came out and called out the effort of the team once again. Uh, there are certain guys in the team that we suspect he's talking about. Um, but we'll wait and see on what happens with that. Um, so Chauncey's been a little upset. What do you think about that? I know you were just talking about his coaching and how you don't think it's all him necessarily, but do you think it has more to do with his coaching or if it has more to do with the team's energy and just effort levels at this point? I, I 100% don't blame Chauncey for this. I mean, I don't understand. I There's all these fans online that, look, we were pro Stotts guys. We thought Stotts was a good coach, and I understand that when you cleared house, you probably should have cleared both the front office and Neil – or I'm sorry, Neil and Terry. But I don't think that Chauncey's to blame for the malaise that's over this team right now. Dame's injured and or out of these games, and – CJ just looks like he doesn't really care. It looks like a been there, done that. They know that this team does not have the composition to win it all. And so when they come in against an opponent that they're overmatched, they just give up. It's, it's, it's a fight issue. It's a heart issue. And as much as I know the coach is responsible for motivating players, this isn't high school. This is not a, a no. little league thing where they need to get them. Yeah, they're grown men. You need to be a professional and be ready to go in there and scrap and fight. And this team just doesn't look like they have it outside of, at times, Nurk, Larry Nance, Nasir Little, though Norman Powell. Norman Powell is constantly giving you Our all Our favorite players are this year by far. Oh, dude, he's unbelievable. But, uh, you know, Anthony Simon, CJ, th there are guys, Dame, Dame at times looks like he doesn't care. And then Tony Snell at times is a little hit or miss. So I, I don't Tony know. Snell. I don't know exactly what's going on, but I, I just I don't blame Chauncey as much as other people do. I'm not going to sit here and slander him as a coach. I think that the defensive system that he's brought in makes a lot of sense. I don't think Rocco is really doing no. a lot for him. He needs the personnel to run the system a little bit better. Right. Agreed. I'm not mad at Chauncey right now. I think there are things that he could improve upon, but we've, we've talked this is the roster issue for years now. Yeah. But CJ's here. Uh, he's not playing like the all-star that he's getting paid to be, but – as far as Blazers go, he had a pretty pretty awesome achievement this week. For those who don't know, CJ McCollum moved into top five highest scoring Blazers of all time. I believe he's right behind Lamarcus. It's wild, actually. And, uh, and Porter. Yep. So Terry <laughs> Porter and Lamarcus are right above him, and then obviously Lillard and Drexler are the two greatest Blazers of all time. So happy for him. Uh, mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I mean, he scores a lot. It's a volume score. It's no surprise to me that he's up here. I think Brandon Roy would have been in his position, probably been the top three player, even over LaMarcus before his time was done. But happy to see that he's, he's up there. We have a good scoring backcourt. That is the one thing that I can't argue. I don't think they're good together. I don't think the defense is there. But nobody can deny that they are a good scoring backcourt. They're consistently mm -hmm. tops in the league in highest scoring duos. Uh, and he, he was rewarded with it with being top five in Blazers history in points scored. He's not going to stop anytime. Well, if we had, if we had it our way, he'd probably stop sometime soon. Um, but as long as he's a Blazer, you know, you can expect him to easily pass, easily get to third. I, I think Lamarcus and Porter, he can pass easily. He'll never get higher than Dame. Um, I don't see him getting in, up to the Drexler levels. Um, I hope he's not here to get there. But that's it. That's all I have on the weekly, the weekly hits. Just some things we noticed. Obviously, Chauncey calling out the players and being public about it. The injuries and how they're affecting us. CJ going top five. That's it. That's all we got, right? That's it for this pod. There's no other. Yeah, that's it. News. Let's wrap it. There's no yeah. other news. Let's just. <laughs> let's turn it well, off. You, honestly, on Friday morning, how did you learn of the news? Uh, on Friday. Friday morning, it was like eight thirty or nine. I can't remember. It was really early. You. <laughs> actually i woke up and you're like it's official and i'm like what we trade cj then god i'm like half awake like waking up like it was a dream and it was probably the next <laughs> best thing um the next best thing was hashtag no more neil i'm making that a thing i'm sorry I, I, it's a little late now but i'm gonna make it a thing it's neil good. olshay everyone if you haven't heard then you're not a blazers fan we're obviously a little late to this party but he is gone he is fired 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they said it was basically conduct detrimental to the team, you know, the way that he was running the team and how he was making people feel. And a lot of people stepped forward and came out and basically said that he was running a very hostile environment. I think our biggest beef with him is basically just not making the trade, not trading off of his guys. You know, he's been very loyal to a fault, I think. The other thing that was really big was this summer when he fired Stotts, he basically ran the bus over him and backed it back up, saying that it was not a product of the roster. And all of us basically shook our heads at that, except for some. And we truly believe that this team needed in the offseason. You and I said it in June and July. This team needs to break this core up and rebuild around Dame if you want to give him something to kind of stay in Portland. I mean, I, I would have understood if he pushed out this summer, but I think that the new GM will be able to do that. Yeah, and you know, I, listen, from a basketball perspective, there were obviously things that Neil did that sucked. He wasn't all bad. He did no. get us Nurk. I mean, he, he gave yes. he got Nurk in the first round pick from Mason Plumley. Like, okay, so that was awesome. Let's not forget, we, we give so much, you know, it's hit or miss. So many people nag on the summer of 2016, and rightfully so. But LaMarcus didn't want to come back. That was done anyway. Wesley was coming off of the Achilles. You weren't bringing him back at the kind of money that he probably wanted. It made sense at the time to move off of Batum because Absolutely. it really kind of felt like Batum was hit or miss. We never really liked him. And, again, you're not giving Batum a max contract. So – it made sense to let a lot of those guys walk. We were upset about – not upset, but I think confused about some of the moves he made. I mean, Myers Leonard, the big contract that he got. Alan Crabb. I and mean, Turner. what? And then, yeah, and obviously Turner get basically a max contract. Now, Turner worked out. We may not like Evan Turner. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't it wasn't my least favorite Blazer, but he was pivotal in the run to the Western Conference Finals. He played the backup point forward position – to a T, he had a triple double a couple times, I think once at least. Um, and he was a decent defender, he just couldn't score. I mean, every time we saw him get the ball in his hands, we call him Evan Turnover because the guy was atrocious, but he was able to at least run the offense for the most part. Neil mm -hmm. was also responsible for going out and getting Seth Curry for dimes, like he mm -hmm. just just nickels. He's like, Here, you want a minimum contract? We know you, you're, you were coming off the injury, and how important was he? Mo Harkless was a great find for cheap. Mm -hmm. Chief, let's not sit here and say oh, that Alex Aminu was not pivotal Chief. in the Western Conference Finals. I mean, if he wouldn't have got hurt uh, after we let him go, I, I would have loved to have him back. The defense that he gave and the three-point shooting that he gave, I think Rocco we thought was going to be a lot better, but he played that same type of role. Yes. So there were good things. He was able to get off some contracts. I mean, he got his white side, who we wanted for a while. Mm -hmm. White side didn't work out, granted. He wasn't the player that we were hoping he would be. But they gave what? I mean, like Myers nothing. Leonard for him? Like Myers yep. Leonard for him? Come on. He was able to turn the Evan the Evan Turner contract into Kent Bazemore, who, again, didn't work out like we thought. But at but the could time, have. it mm -hmm. was a good trade. He was a shooter. He was a scrappy defender, or so we thought. He, he did that stuff in Atlanta. So mm -hmm. it, it made sense to get rid of Turner, who, by the way, got hurt and didn't play anymore. Went on to coaching after that. Um, so there were good things that he did. But yeah. I think, unfortunately... The CJ thing is going to be the number one red flag. Not moving off yeah. of CJ is the number one red flag. Um, he was able to get Nurk to sign bet for cheap, and I don't think he would have wanted to bring Nurk back after this year. So there were the potential to break the roster up. I don't think Rocco makes it past the deadline, but at the same time, basketball stuff aside, you don't want a guy who runs a hostile work environment. It was overdue. I'm um, apparently from the interviews and we don't know much. Not, not a lot was really released. In fact, the mm -hmm. investigation got quiet for a while. And people were starting to wonder, but I don't know. That's, that's my take on it. I, I don't think from a basketball perspective, he was terrible. I just don't think he did enough to help Dame. And the only thing that you could do was trade CJ. I mean, there's nothing else you could do. You only have so much money. You got Nurk on a good deal. I mean, you trade picks away for Rocco. That's a win now move. We yep. were all excited about Rocco. There were things that he did that were <laughs> legit. And I think with the means that we had, were not terrible decisions to try to build a roster. But CJ's contract makes it darn near impossible to really add anything of substantial value. You're consistently high in the draft, or I should say low. You're you're up in the high 20s. Yep. Being you're out of the lottery. I mean, what are you gonna do? I mean, it's hit or miss. We can go back and look at all his draft picks, and I know you have a couple that you'll probably bring up that you've been upset about for years, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were guys that you could have taken over Zach Collins, but at the time, he was touted as one of the best big men in the draft coming out of Gonzaga. So 
not completely terrible to take a chance on him. You didn't have, you know, certain guys at that time, so it made sense to go get him, but I don't yeah. know. I didn't I, hate him in the basketball perspective as much as some people. There were definitely things that could have been done differently. Um, I definitely. What's your take on it? I mean, look, all this stuff has already been vetted a hundred times. What he's done times. wrong. The t- 2017 draft to me is the number one. I don't even care about the money in 2016. I thought that some of that money actually made a lot of sense. I agree with you on the summer of 2016. Trading Batum was the right move. Not offering Wesley Matthews a contract at that time was the right move. Though That was the correct thing to do. Evan Turner could have worked a whole different way. If you would have traded CJ, it would have made a ton of sense. Um, but regardless... 2017 draft is the only thing I really honestly always held against Neil as I don't understand what he was thinking. And if Zach Collins had stayed healthy, maybe we would have known what he was thinking, but it didn't happen. I just, I, the biggest thing for me is his stubbornness to not build around Dame in a different way. And I love the Rocco move. I thought Rocco Nance, I, I, I like a lot of these moves. I thought, I thought Derek Jones Jr. was going to pan out. I thought um, Mo Harkless, Kent Bazemore, all these guys I thought would be were good acquisitions at the time for what the Blazers needed. Now, a lot of those guys, like you said, didn't pan out long term. But to be able to move off of Alan Crabb and Evan Turner, Myers Leonard, some of these contracts that he signed, to be able to move those was pretty nifty work uh, from Neil on the salary cap stuff for a luxury team that was going to be in the repeater tax. So I loved Whiteside. I thought Whiteside was a fantastic get. I thought Cantor both times was a good get for Neil. Um, So you really can't like kill the guy on the personnel side. He just wasn't willing to make the trade and he didn't run the team in a way that was, I think, up to Portland and Oregon standards of transparency, um, leadership, character, those those kind of uh, intangibles. But yeah, I mean, I'm glad he's gone, and I'm ready to rebuild this team. Yeah, and I, I will add, I think my least favorite move, my favorite move was probably getting Nurk, honestly, mm. for, for Plumley. You got a first out of that deal as well. It's That's crazy. my favorite Neil move. My least favorite Neil move had to be bringing back Carmelo Anthony. I understand why we did it the first time around with the injury. You know, Rodney Hood got hurt. He was starting to get a little banged up in the wing position there. It mm-hmm. made sense to see what he had. Let's pull him off the streets. Let's put him in. We got the bubble situation going on. Um, I mean, granted, he was here before the bubble situation, but still, like still. it made sense at yeah. the time. The bringing him back bit, not my favorite move. Um, yep. I didn't think we needed him at the time. <clears throat> I, I just don't see why you brought him back. And it was obviously a terrible decision because him and Cantor were responsible for one of the worst defenses in league history. Um, at least from a bench perspective, and Stotts, you're almost forced to, to go through him. What else are you going to do? Amp probably wasn't ready. We've seen inconsistencies out of him. You could have played more little. I get that. But even then, when he was on the court, he was still a little raw. So it made sense to go through Carmelo a little bit more. But mm-hmm. that's because he's on the roster. If he's not here, you, everything changes. You probably get more little. You probably get more Amp. But you brought him in. It's hard to not play a player like that mm-hmm. just on pedigree alone. He's friends with dame dave it's just it's tough so that was my least favorite move to bring him back i want to hear real quick before we end your favorite and least favorite neil move before we we kind of touch on a little bit my favorite and least favorite move okay so i would say by far okay my, my least favorite move is i don't understand why in 2019 you ponied up to max out CJ as much as the 2017 draft is like a, what, why did you do that? You can understand where Zach Collins and Caleb Swanigan stay healthy and productive and they take the coaching and they become next level power forwards or even tweener centers. The CJ 2019 contract, like who were you bidding against to max him out? Why did you have to extend it for five years? Why did you poison pill it? Like why there's all these things about the CJ contract that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I understand you wanted to give your the solidarity um, to, to the Blazers and what we were trying to do. And you want to make an asset out of him. But once you maxed out a guy who'd never made an all-star game and you ponied up the payroll for two small guards we literally locked this core in and you were just going to be making fringe moves from there on out it was my least favorite move in hindsight but but denver game seven well and and 
<clears throat> that's the thing where like you can argue it. I get it. It's just to me, that was what locked us into this exact core. I don't, I mean, I thought, yeah. I thought Neil did a really good job of actually drafting young guys that could pan out and they didn't. And he kind of had bad luck in that stretch, but the, the CJ thing, I understand I'd max Dame and I'd super max Dame. I just never understood the money for CJ ever. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, favorite move. Man, that Nurkic deal was pretty stacked. And at the time, I actually thought that the Roco deal was going to be the move that put us over the top. Like that was a deal that I thought, okay, he's going to be mm-hmm. able to defend three to four positions. I didn't understand that he would he couldn't move laterally the way he can't, that he was so limited. I really thought Nurkic or, or Nurkic and Covington as a front court was going to make a ton of sense for this team. And now in hindsight, even that was a mistake, but I was all I was all about it when yeah, it happened. We're- Yep. Roka's not shooting nearly as good, and you know he doesn't it's have the shot, fault. the shots that he was supposed to be coming in and making. And the defense is really we saw in those clips multiple times. He just got stuck, and they went right around him. So, yeah, but that's it. No more Neil, regardless. Um, any word? Let me see if you got any word on the replacement GMs. Any candidates you're looking forward to? The names have already kind of came up, but uh, yeah. anything that you you looking don't. forward to there? I don't honestly. I mean, I've heard that the Bulls GM. I've heard the um, very Tayshawn Prince. Tayshawn Prince. Danny. Danny Ainge keeps popping up, but I don't think they're actually going to call him because I don't think they're going to retread a GM. They just have a new. They have a new coach that is probably going to stay on when the new GM comes on. So I don't think it's going to be Danny Ainge. I think it's going to be. I think they're going to call and interview Tayshawn Prince. I think they're going to talk to the Bulls GM, and I think they're going to talk to the Knicks GM because both of those guys have rebuilt teams around vets. You know, Zach Levine may not be a veteran in a lot of people's eyes, but they rebuilt a team. Yeah, they rebuilt a team around him in Chicago real quick that is looking deadly. So I I, I, New York and I see those two names. I don't think are going to they don't think that works out. I'm sorry. I don't see why you would leave that situation. You built something now. Now you're getting to play around with it. Now it's yours. Mm -hmm. You're you're I just don't see them leaving those situations. Sure. Barry is an interesting one for me just because, you know, Oregon State guy. He, uh, uh, Spurs have just been good. Like yes. they, they continue to develop. They continue to make moves that always compete. I mean, they just whooped us down. Um, bad. So I, that one makes sense to me. Um, I just like that organization. I always have, they're always good. So I would, I would like to see him get some, some serious look. Um, I don't know about the Danny Ainge thing. Like, I, yeah, no. Boston, Boston made some crazy moves and they also kind of hurt themselves in, in the making of those moves, but he's mm-hmm. been fine. I know the big thing is that again, he's a Portland guy, um, which obviously is something that everybody loves. He's invested here. Uh, sure. He does have the potential to make big moves. He does that is sometimes it's detrimental to the team, but at least he's not as scared to take big risks. Yep. You want the CJ trade done. That's the first way to get it done. Um, but I guess time will tell. We're not going to speculate. and We're not mm-hmm. one to really talk too much about that stuff yet. When we hear more rumors, we'll kind of break down some of the names maybe in the next episode because this is a big one. Yeah. Uh, so we'll kind of touch on that as we follow up and rumors start to come out and, and get involved. I don't think anything crazy happens in the meantime. I hope they get the GM thing figured out. I hope the interim situation isn't long-term. Deadline is t- two months away, a little over. So, mm-hmm. you know, Roko and Nick's contracts are expiring. I think there's a lot to be done there. I don't think CJ gets moved. You and me both agree CJ probably doesn't get moved. So. Not with a new GM. No. And, and you have move. to you're gonna get hired and make a franchise altering move like that. You better you better to make the salaries move. work is really hard too. And in order to do that, you gotta have a re, a, a big trade in mind and the Simmons thing right. it, ain't, it ain't gonna right. happen. And you gotta build connections and there's a lot of things that get they get yep. involved there. You have to start talking with Dame and there's a lot that goes into that. So that's it, man. Um you know, we, we could probably sit here and just be how talk about how excited we are that Neil's gone all day. I think everybody's done more than enough celebrating. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I posted a tweet that my phone died almost. I was scrolling. I'm just scrolling and liking stuff. I'm like, I, yeah, yeah, everybody. On like Twitter. This is great. He's gone. This is all party. I was so ecstatic. Was um, and I'm I'm looking forward to the, the potential changes in the next couple of years because believe it or not, everybody, Dame's window is closing. Um, it's closing fast. He's closing faster than you think. He's he's in his 30s now. He's yeah. going to want to win more than ever. I don't care what he says. Um, you know, I believe that he wants to be here, but if moves aren't made to, to keep him here, then it's going to get ugly in the next couple of years. So a new GM is, is the perfect breath of fresh air to really start breathing into the team. So it is for now. 
Uh, the move is made. It's made early, I guess, earlier than I thought it would be, but happy it's done. I think for a lot of people, this will open up some some really good doors for us. Yeah, and then next Sunday, we're going to be a little late on the pod. We'll probably record on Tuesday next week because you're going yeah. to Green Bay. Yes, I will be in Green Bay at the Bears game, flying in to watch, watch my boys go to, what, 10 and 3, 9 and 3. I don't remember exactly where we're at, something like that. We're winning a lot. I can keep track of it. Yeah. But <laughs> no, I'm going to go. I'm going to go do that. So I'll come back. I get back late Monday. So I don't think we'll have a chance to record Monday. So it'll be a weird schedule for us. Probably mm-hmm. Tuesday we'll record and get it up pretty quick. Um, speaking of next week, you want to just show the games, get the schedule popped up. You have it. <sighs> Yeah, I do. I have it right here. And like I said earlier, it ain't it ain't pretty, dude. No, nope, just so, a quick touch on it. All right. So we're gonna play the Clippers tomorrow night. Then we play the Warriors on Wednesday, <laughs> Timberwolves, which we'll talk about, and then we will record that night of the Suns, but we will not touch on that game probably. So no, the next we won't have to, yeah, we won't talk Suns games. We'll record. We're gonna be able to watch the game. So we'll record before the Suns game. We'll get up yep. there and get it out. Um, but we will have the Clippers, the Warriors, and the Timberwolves. Yep. Not so ideal. I'll be at the game tomorrow. If anybody wants to hit me up on the on the tweeters, I'll, I'll get a drink with you. And uh, yeah, obviously the Warriors are the Warriors. Um, not ideal. Not without, not without Dame. The injuries. The Clippers and the Warriors are both going to be really tough. Timberwolves mm-hmm. are sneaky. I, you know, they they look like they're finally starting to kind of put the young talent together. They're they're still a fringe team in the bottom, but a tough matchup for us. Um, mm-hmm. Just because those scrappy young teams that have a lot of energy are always going to be really tough to play. So that's what we have to look forward to. Uh, and that's all I got for you. I mean, subscribe, like, share. We want to be able to do more giveaways and all that fun stuff. Appreciate the support, everyone. Anything else you want to – any final thoughts? That's it. Thanks for tuning right. in, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Yep. Rip City Real Talk out. We out.